All right, so the last portion of chapter seven um, that we're covering today has to do with power. Now, power is a new type of quantity that is related to energy, but is not the same thing as energy. And so a lot of students get those mixed up and we wanna make sure we understand that they are different from each other. So the equation that we are um, thinking about in this section is that power is defined as the amount of work over the elapsed time. So if you are adding energy to a system at a certain rate, we can figure out what that rate is using the idea of power. And in, in more general terms, power is functionally energy per unit time, so energy over time, where we have to be thinking about the specific energy associated with a process or a specific energy term and how quickly we are adding to that energy term, things like that. We'll see that over the course of this video. The units for power are watts. So just like in a for a light bulb, if you have a 70 watt light bulb, that is trying to tell you that it is using up energy and you're paying for that in your energy bill at 70 joules per second because one watt is one joule per second. There are conversion factors that are gonna come up in this section. There's a conversion factor for power that we will see um, show up a little bit later that 746 watts is equal to one horsepower. So when you are thinking about um, purchasing a car or you hear car commercials and they talk about horsepower, that is, that is how quickly um, that engine can, can use up energy. There's gonna be a conversion factor for energy that shows up as well that turns our standard idea of joules from earlier in chapter seven into the unit of kilowatt hours, where if you are the one responsible for the energy bill for your household, um, you will have seen that, uh, that unit because we pay our energy bills in units of kilowatt hours, and that's the amount of energy that we've been using up in a certain time frame. So a simple starter question for us to think about and you can go through this um, in your notes as well, but we're just gonna talk ourselves through this particular one. Our goal is to find the energy used by a 75 watt light bulb that is on for eight hours. So 75 watts is the power and eight hours is the time. We can start with the original equation from the previous slide that power is energy over time and then multiply both sides by time where in order for the units to all match up, that eight hours has to be in units of seconds. And so we can multiply it by 60 minutes per hour and 60 seconds per minute. And that's where the numbers on the next line come from. When we go through all of that, the energy for a single light bulb for a single day is over two million joules. Now, no one is gonna want to get a bill from their electric company that tells them that they're using up millions of something, okay? Because that just doesn't seem like anything that is reasonable. You, you would probably remember if you used up a million of something, right? And so that's why that unit of kilowatt hours was defined. Instead of watts, we're thinking about kilowatts, and instead of seconds, we're thinking about hours. And so that's where the um, unit conversion comes in. A kilowatt hour is a thousand watts times 3,600 seconds, and so it is 3.6 million joules per kilowatt hour. The cost varies by location. So when we are thinking about electricity bills, um, this map is from almost two decades ago, and it shows in a general sense how much it costs per kilowatt hour to, um, to use electricity in different states. And the costs are based on how easily um, electricity can be made available in those areas. And so places that have mountains and rivers and can build hydroelectric dams, that's one of the cheapest ways and most reliable ways to have um, energy come in. And so those tend to be cheaper um, places for electricity. Here in Michigan, we were kind of on the high side, but at least we weren't New England, right? Um, and so if we looked at that 75 watt light bulb and had it on for eight hours, the 0.6 kilowatt hours that it used up would have cost us about a nickel. But think about that, even two decades ago, every single light bulb in your house, every single day, cost about a nickel. Not so great when you add it all up. 
This map is a little bit newer and it's from our textbook. And we see that all of a sudden, for some reason, Michigan has jumped up into that highest bracket um, and they've not bothered to even show Alaska and Hawaii because that's bad news over there too. And so I want us to use this map uh, and we're gonna round it just to 14 cents per kilowatt hour, not 14.64 to try on your own, so pause the video and try on your own, the cost of running a 75 watt light bulb for an entire day if the electricity costs 14 cents per kilowatt hour. So we will do that on the um, whiteboard and show it, but I want you to try it on your own too. So whether that's um, writing it as I'm writing it or whether it's pausing the video to give yourself more time, either way. So the power is the 75 watts that we were told about. And if we want to use those fancy kilowatt hours, then we would have to multiply by one kilowatt per 1,000 watts. And so we get 0 0.075 kilowatts. The time involved is one day, which is the same thing as 24 hours. And so if we think about power as energy per time, then we can, we can see what's going on here. We've got the power here is 0 0.075 kilowatts, and the time is 24 hours. So we have 0 0.075 kilowatts. I'm going to multiply both sides by time times 24 hours, we get energy in these units of kilowatt hours. And that is a valid unit for us to think about. Okay, And so if we do that, we will get 1.8 kilowatt hours, 1.8 kilowatt hours. And then if we want to think about how much that costs, if it's 14 cents per kilowatt hour, then we would take that 1.8 kilowatt hours, and just like a unit conversion where we've come up with a new unit, each kilowatt hour costs 14 cents. So we multiply 1.8 times 14, and we will get 25 cents. So the slide has it using our standard units. The board here has it using our kilowatt hour um, set of units. But in both cases, we get to the end result of it takes about a quarter. Um, so a um, American quarter to pay for that um, light bulb. If you leave it on all day, every day, it'll cost you one quarter per day. So. Turn your lights off when you're not using them. The other thing to be aware of is that joules and watts are closely related, but they are not interchangeable units. We cannot directly convert between watts and joules because they're trying to measure different types of things. It's something that students often mix up, or if we give a, um, a quantity in joules that we think it's accidentally power, or if we give a quantity in watts, we think it's accidentally energy. We want to make sure to keep those ideas separate in our head. So the next thing to consider then is that all of those kinds of terms that we talked about in the early part of chapter seven, we could think about how quickly we are adding or subtracting that energy. So for example, if I had a five kilogram block, we're going to pretend this, um, whiteboard erasers, five kilograms. What power would be associated with me lifting this five kilogram block to a two meter height? So that's over six feet um, above the ground or above the starting point. If it took me 1.5 seconds to raise it that two full meters. So that phrasing, what power is associated with the lift is important simply because what it's trying to have us think about is the fact that there might be a lot of um, a lot of different things happening, right? My muscles are um, are warming up when I lift things, and there's all sorts of things going on. 
but the power associated with the lift means that trackable amount of power. I have now transferred energy to that block. And if we think about this situation, what I have transferred is gravitational potential energy. And so the power associated with that is going to be the energy involved over the time that it took. So in general, power is energy over time. And for this particular situation, it's gravitational potential energy over that amount of time. And so we have the 5 kilogram block times 9.8 times 2 meters all over 1.5 seconds. So we have 98 divided by 1.5. Then we get 65.3 watts. Okay, so that's not too bad. That's like um, a light bulb. But, you know, if I'm going to be constantly lifting five kilogram blocks, um, six and a half feet in the air, I'm going to get tired pretty quickly. That won't be a sustainable amount of power for me for very long. And if we think about it in terms of um, horsepower and the original idea of one horsepower is a sustainable rate at which energy can be um, can be used up or um, or transferred from a horse. When farmers had horses pulling plows and things like that, um, a horsepower was basically what horses were able to do for a um, somewhat consistent basis over the course of the day. So. Humans can't do nearly as much as horses can, and so it's no surprise that uh, a farmer had a better chance of getting work done with a horse and a plow. So that useful energy of 65 watts um, went into the lift. We note that there's a lot other things going on there, but that's why we have that weird phrasing that we'll see all throughout this portion of the chapter. Okay, so here's another one, very similar kind of idea. We have a baseball and we're going to say that it's hit from rest. So certainly the baseball's uh, coming at the pitcher and then going away from the pitcher. But we're going to just imagine that the latter, the latter part where the baseball was at rest because it was against the bat. And then all of a sudden it's going off at 40 meters per second. We want to find the power associated with that. So just like before, we're trying to figure out what kind of energy is being stored in that situation. And instead of gravitational potential energy this time, we now have kinetic energy. So for the kinetic energy, we have power is energy per time, but now that's one half mv squared on top and the time on the bottom. So we have one half, the baseball is 0 0.15 kilograms. The final speed that we got it to is 40, we square that. And then the time is 1.5 milliseconds, where milli means 10 to the minus three, and so we end up with 0 0.0015 on the bottom. And so we get 80,000 watts. That sounds awesome. That's a huge power, right? But the key thing, that 80,000 watts, if we think about that uh, number value, it only lasted a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. So if we were to use that power in order to keep a 60 watt light bulb um, lit up, we would want to figure out how much energy uh, or how long um, that power would work. So the total amount of energy involved from that is going to be the power that we used, which is what we just found, times the time that it lasted. So that 80,000 watts times that tiny, tiny fraction of time is 120 joules. So that's the energy involved, the first of our two questions on the slide. And if we're thinking about how long it could power a 60 watt light bulb, a 60 watt light bulb, total energy of 120 joules 
If we solve for the amount of time there, it's going to be two seconds. So that super impressive sounding power from that baseball hit um, would only be able to keep that light bulb on, on for two seconds. So not actually all that exciting in the end. The textbook goes into a lot of different uh, real world circumstances. There's several different um, tables of information and kind of interesting ideas there. And it's worth looking through those sections. Uh, there's just a lot more there than what we really need. But it goes through, for example, all of your different um, organs constantly need to be powered to do what they're supposed to do. And the rates, the standard um, rates for those are listed in the book. Uh, it goes through some standard power, um, so energy rate of consumption um, for different things, both magnificently huge numbers astronomically, as well as standard uh, things that happen uh, in our everyday lives. But the other interesting thing in this portion of the book is remembering or reminding ourselves that we need food in order to have energy available to power all of those internal organs, but also to actually walk around and do things. So our textbook is gonna have examples where two different energies are being produced, right? In the first example we just did on the um, board, I lifted a block and we just had potential energy from gravity. In the second example, we just hit a baseball and we only had kinetic energy. But for example, somebody who's at the um, ground floor of a building who runs up the stairs and now has kinetic energy and potential energy, we could track both of those and figure out the, um, the total energy and the power associated with that as well. But I want us to think about the fact that that energy had to come from somewhere. That energy came from all of that, um, that woman's muscles powering um, the movement and allowing her to walk up the stairs or run up the stairs. And that energy comes from the food that we eat. We have, um, I'll go back a slide, we have a conversion factor that we will see uh, in some examples as well as on our equation sheets that um, goes back and forth between standard um, joules and food calories. It showed up briefly in one of our earlier lecture um, videos. We just want to remember that that reason that we have those food calories, like if I want to figure out how much um, energy a box of popcorn is going to get me, I look here and each uh, each cup of popped popcorn is going to get me 20 food calories worth of energy, most of which is going to go into powering um, my internal organs, but it's also going to allow me to go for a walk in a couple of minutes. The last main thing I want to comment on before we wrap up this chapter is that we haven't really talked about one of the key things that is true about energy, which is that energy is conserved. And if we look back at all of the different examples that we've had, there's lots of situations where we have more energy in the system that we're looking at or less energy in the system that we're looking at when we compare before and after. And it's important for us to recognize that this idea that energy is conserved is only happening on the global, universal scale. So if we imagine friction, for example, friction does work on systems. It takes energy out of the system that we can follow. But that energy goes somewhere. It isn't automatically just disappeared because energy can't be created or destroyed. Instead, when we have sliding friction, for example, when something is sliding across something else, that heats things up. Heat is actually energy, and it's energy that we just can't track in our Physics 125 problems. The heat now is making all of the atoms and molecules move around a little bit faster. That energy is still somewhere, but now it can't be tracked anymore. We can't follow it around in our system. So when we have energy come into a system because we're pushing on something to speed it up, that came from our muscles, and remember that came from the food that we ate, which came from somewhere else. Energy simply is moving around, and sometimes it is trackable types of information, kinetic energy, potential energy from gravity, potential energy from springs, and sometimes it's something that we can no longer track with our Physics 125 tools, but it still exists. 
And that's what uh, we mean by energy, uh, energy being conserved. And our energy balance problems just seek to focus on a smaller system and track what we're able to for that smaller system. So that's all the slides that we have for you throughout all of chapter seven. If we look back at the playlist uh, or the um, posted videos in Blackboard, there are four total lecture videos and um, eight total example videos. All of that together is meant to be one week's worth of lecture. If we were in class, um, we would have two hours on uh, Tuesday and two hours on Thursday. And that's when we would cover all of this material. So although it might seem like a lot, we've just tried to break it down into smaller pieces. And in the end, those pieces time-wise add up to about one week's worth of one week, one week's worth of in-class time. So we'll do all of this again next week in chapter eight. Uh, for now, we'll start to post some examples to work on um, and to practice with, and uh, we'll go from there. So I'll see you then.